All right, so I'm going to talk about what uh, what work on Puppet at Backstop looks like. Uh, people have said that uh, it's interesting to just see how people actually do it, not these idea talks of, here's some things we could do. I'll do a little of that. Um, but like, actually, if you were to start at Backstop and work on Puppet, this is what it would look like. Uh, please ask questions. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at any point in here. Um, if you can't read something, I can't do a whole lot about that, let me know. Uh, so I'm Bill. Uh, I'm Bill Weiss, almost everywhere. Uh, I've been at Backstop for five and a half years. I was the first Puppet users there. Um, I hired most of our people who do Puppet full time, but we now have almost 30 people doing it, so it's not just my team anymore. Um, I don't actually write Puppet code day to day anymore, so it's possible this is, if my team were here, they would tell you that I'm totally wrong. Probably not, but it's possible. Uh, and then my company, Backstop, uh, SAS, the alternative asset industry. Uh, we run it, but it's a, it's a hosted platform for our customers. Uh, it's all Linux, it's all software we wrote. And we are always hiring developers, we are always hiring QA people, we are always hiring pretty much anything customer facing, sales, support, professional services. Uh, sadly, not hiring systems right now. But, yes. <laughs> um, Web page, if you want to talk to me about those afterward, I'm happy to tell you about the company and ask, answer any questions. So, uh, at a high level, what are we doing? Um, that's completely unreadable in the back, isn't it? Oh, ha, go Google, thank you. Uh, so, uh, 10,500 commits, uh, 24 people who've written to it. Uh, I went to get these stats last night because I wanted them to be super current, and it says that half of our repo is digital command language. I'm fairly sure that that's actually puppet code because otherwise there's no way that's right. But lots of puppet code, some Perl, some Shell, some Ruby. Uh, about 600 machines that are reporting into Puppet, reporting into M-Collective right now, uh, plus Vagrant and all of those, but this is, this is live machines running M-Collective right now. Uh, so if you were to start, if you were to start backstop, you have a puppet change you want to make. What would you do? Uh, you fork. So we, we're all GitHub uh, private repos, and so you would fork to your personal copy. Um, I can't right now because I already have a fork, but I can do it as DevOps as I suppose. You create a local branch. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And then you get writing code. Um, I just want to point this out. I'm super proud of my using entirely like preview, changing that. It's a terrible image. <laughs> um, my wife just shook her head when she saw that. Really? That's, that's pretty good. Uh, and then there's pre-kind hooks that keep you from doing a thing too terrible. Uh, I want to point out, people use this image all the time. How many of you actually know where this came from? Hyperbole Other than, and a half. Thank you. Other than meme generator. There's a, a website called Hyperbole and a Half. It's hilarious. Go read it. There's a link right there. Uh, everybody's ripped on it, and nobody even knows where it came from. Uh, so you push up to your copy. Uh, I'm not going to show you the terminal, you know what that looks like. Uh, and then test it. Uh, please. Uh, everybody has to use this image at least once in a DevOps talk. Uh, I guess there wasn't one this morning. I'm sorry. But, um, this is not actually how it is. Um, we, the people who wrote the code are responsible for getting it tested, getting it merged. I'll talk about all that. Uh, once you've done all that testing, uh, you pull into backstops into the main, uh, the main puppet repo in the office branch. Uh, it gets merged into master, and then that's in prod. Everybody can go do that now, right? Probably not. But... Uh, those changes go from in your editor to in production in a day, unless you have extensive testing you want to do or you want to. Uh, we refer to letting it bake for a while if you want to run it in an office environment for a while in test, it's fine. I should mention, uh, I know this is kind of a bad puppet smell, but we do it. Uh, most of the production instances only run puppet once a day after hours. Uh, our usage is very nine to five for our customer time, and so we run it after that just to make sure nothing will go wrong. Uh, a bit about what's on disk, it, you don't exactly care, yours will look different, but this will make the rest of it make more sense. Uh, so in the before time, long ago, the dark dark times of backstop, 
uh, like a year ago. <laughs> um, we just had this big old fan subversion. There were no forks. There were no, you know, anything. And so uh, Etsy Puppet on the Puppet Masters was just like an SVN checkout of that directory. It's awesome. Uh, it's awesome as long as like the puppet.conf didn't have to change per environment, which it did. Uh, it was awesome except for when you made a local change and absentmindedly checked it in, like then it's live. Uh, there wasn't any real testing or even ways to test your stuff other than deploying it and saying, good luck, little software, you're free now, run everywhere. And so we now, uh, we're trying to break modules out of their own repositories. We haven't been super successful at that yet because it's, there's some machinery that goes on there, but we are new software goes into its own repository, which is pulled in via librarian. Uh, R10K is amazing software and you should try it. However, it has very strong opinions about what your workflow and your environments look like. And uh, we fought that for, we spent like a month fighting R10K. Like, Why does this thing not work? This is terrible software. It is not a problem. Uh, so try it, but librarian's fine too. Uh, and then we have a site modules which gets stitched into modules on the actual puppet masters. But I'm getting some kind of light stairs. Um, people comfortable with the fra phrase environment in, in puppet land? Yes, no? Yes, I'm good with pup environments. No, I have no idea. All right. Uh, some both. Uh, you can break your code into environments, so you can have a machine tag, this is a production machine, this is a test machine, this is a dev machine. And you can actually be running totally separate puppet code. Uh, they're separate directories of code. And so what we do is we follow a workflow where you commit code into a development environment. So all the development machines will get it. You promote that to the test environment, all the test machines get it. From production, everybody's got it, hopefully. Uh, I'll come into a little more detail there. But environments are a way to model that workflow of, say, dev to test to production. Uh, some places do it for you have a production site and a DR site, you have you know, a US site and a Europe site, whatever. But these are a way to break up your machines into different chunks of puppet code running against the same masters. Hopefully not totally divergent puppet code, but it, it could be. Alright, so, um, yeah. I'm sure you can do this in whatever not GitHub thing you're using. Uh, GitLab, I'm sure does a great job. Hmm? Bitbucket, I'm sure Bitbucket does a very good job. Uh, if you just have some sad machine with copy of RCS on it, you may be on your own, but not do that. Uh, so we have a private repo, I already showed it to you. Uh, we have a set of people who can commit to that. I would love to get to a point where just everybody in the company commit to it. Like if you, if you really want that code to go to production, do it. The testing will save us. Uh, I can't do that yet. We're a bit from there, um, and I'll talk about why in here. Anyways, so there's a team of, it looks like eight people, and then uh, a good, basically these people are the ones who get paged when stuff breaks in production, and so they're the ones who can make things break in production. Well, at least with Puppet. People can break production on this. Uh, two branches, Office and Master. Uh, office should be ahead of master at all times so that we are, so code's always flowing into that production. You make changes in office, which is our test environment, because it's literally in our office. And then after production. Um, if you don't know anything about Git, this is probably confusing. Uh, how many of you have some idea, at least most of you raise your hands, looks, what I'm talking about in forks and branches and get or say subversion. Subversion does something similar. Okay, cool, most of them. Uh, it's a way to break down you know, my, my changes from somebody else's changes so we can merge them at a controlled time as opposed to just all editing it on the Puppet Master. We did that. Uh, um, you're always in, you always keep track of Master. Um, no one ever touches the Office branch directly. The intent is that all of our code gets merged into Office and then merged up to master. You shouldn't be touching office directly. Uh, we've got some aliases set. I can show people what these look like later, but uh, since some of this, this fetch up upstream alias is 250 characters or something, it's, it's, it's a bunch of kind of dense git mangling. And decapitate, I didn't actually, 
So I'm a bad, I'm a bad user. Uh, I had my own alias set up before we did these for everybody. So I had no idea it was called Decapitate. It's awesome. Uh, that gets rid of all your branches that are totally done with, probably. Um, and then an edit script that sets it all up. Okay. So, you're, yes? Do you have a log that you can steal some of that Git code from? Because those are really handy aliases. Yeah. I will happily show, uh, I will get this to you. Remind me afterward, and I will put it somewhere that people can get. A lot of this could be published, and I'll try to do that into a non, uh, into not a private. <coughs> you post it on your meetup thing? Yeah. Yeah, if you follow the meetup page, you will see this stuff. Otherwise, um, I'll ask Kara to retweet it, maybe. But meetup page. Watch the meetup page. Um, and then I will happily do a meetup to talk about these in more detail. Thank you. Um, I won't tell you what editor to use. That preferences. Um, that's up to you. You is anything that can put down ones and zeros on disk, you can figure it out. Um, and so we rely really heavily on pre-commit hooks. So instead of having a, a CI system that runs all that testing for us, we have pre-commit hooks that do a lot of smoke testing right there to make sure your commit is safe. Um, so I'm going to actually show you what they all do. Um, and I can probably, I can publish almost all of this code. Some of it isn't going to be very useful to anybody else, but you can see it, see what I'm doing wrong, nothing else. Uh, so pre-commit just walks through a directory and runs each script in there. And then it, uh, it makes sure that you have the right stuff installed so this will all run. And then it shows you errors. I'm actually going to show you it running. So, the first thing it does is make sure that the pre-commit script is the right pre-commit script. Uh, so Git, those of you who are using Subversion, this is going to be totally alien to you. It's because Git is dumb in this particular way, but it's very smart in others. Uh, Pre-commits are all local. It's on your machine. And so whatever you have in the, pre in the hooks directory is what runs. And so if we change it, you'll never know, and you'll just keep writing code that breaks things. Uh, and so we just MD5 the installed one versus the current one. So this is what it looks like actually working on our stuff. Is this somewhat readable in the back? Yes, because you have the TV there. Awesome. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed my prompt takes up like the entire screen here, but I spent an embarrassing amount of time then trying to make that better and still legible, and I went down that rabbit hole on it. So, uh, so if I make a change to pre-commit.sh, I just put an empty line in there so it differs, uh, and then I try to check in, it fails. It says, hey, you're running the wrong pre-commit. I'm not, you cannot commit without having that installed correctly. Um, and you, yes, you can bypass it. There's a git flag to bypass it. But that will make sure that you're running the most up-to-date one. This does not work the first time. If you never installed a pre-commit, well, this doesn't run. It's tell you that it's not installed. Uh, I'll come to that later. We have a hook that says, don't commit directly to Office or Master. You should not be ever touching the thing that's going out to all those servers without a pull request. Due to, well, occasionally we have to. And so uh, this actually prompts, whoa there, cowboy, you're on master. You sure you don't want PR that? You can say, yep, I'm sure it does it. But the default is no. Um, <laughs> you'll notice a lot of, uh, we're not very, I'm sure our lawyer someday is going to tell us this text is all wrong. Be more formal or something. Yeah. And so, I, in case I didn't make this point, I realized I didn't say explicitly. The reason I'm running through all of these is these are things that have helped us, each and every one. Right? This is a thing that we had to catch because otherwise it broke our stuff, or it made our machines very sad, uh, or it made our puppet master very sad in a couple of cases, which are hard to fix. And so, you should be at least thinking of these. Again, I can publish almost all of these. Uh, ERB files. Uh, we just run them to make sure that they parse. I don't make sure they're right. It's a whole other problem, but they at least don't blow up. It is pretty difficult to make, like intentionally make an ERB file bad. I, sp I spent kind of a bunch of time finding this. Uh, but it happens in, in real commits when people are being making access. Mm -hmm. So I kick a kind of a chunk of Ruby into test.erb, try to commit, it says nope, that does not that does not commit cleanly. Uh, you can see that it's, this is the actual output of Ruby when you say, hey, Ruby, run that DRB file. So it's not, if you don't know Ruby, you don't know ERB very well, this is not actually super helpful because where is that error in that file? Not entirely. 
Um, but if you're touching the, if you're messing with those, you probably should know what you're doing. And this never changes if you're not writing Ruby in there. If you're just adding text to a template, it never happens. Uh, Puppet Lint. We actually run this. How many of you know about Puppet Lint? It's a fantastic piece of software. Uh, so Puppet Lint codifies all the Puppet Lab style guides about what your code should look like, and it will tell you where you where you don't sync up. And so are you mixing tabs and spaces? Are you using double quotes in weird places or single quotes in weird places? Do you have unqualified variables? That sort of thing. Uh, it will complain if you make a change that looks bad, but there are certain things that are just an error where it says Puppet is not going to like this at all. It is not going to run. Uh, as an example, now that, uh, this is uh, this is a change that actually broke uh, broke our Puppet Master a couple years ago, or broke broke running Puppet. Uh, having a dash in a class name is a real problem. The auto loader not okay with that, but it kind of works sometimes. Maybe newer versions of Puppet doesn't work at all, but the old versions it would kind of work maybe. And so I just wrote out a new class that is what has dashes in it. And it says, hey, uh, that is not, uh, that format isn't OK. It's not an autoload mo module layout. You have to go look that up in Lint. Most of its error, most of its things it complains about are just warnings. So it will tell you that you can still commit. But in this case, it actually fails your commit. There's also another thing there, which is a later one. Uh, the driver, I mentioned this up front, the driver that we're using here that we wrote uh, runs all the pre-commit hooks, even if one fails. So that if you have something that fails in a few places, you will see it in all those places, not just fix it, oh, it fails there, fix it, fails there. Um, we use librarian for the public file, and we use bundler for all of our the Ruby stuff attached to this. And a real source of consternation for people is changing one of those files, but not the lock that tells it what actual versions of everything to use. And so we just we fail if that we fail if that doesn't happen, and that is pretty much. I've got one of the gem file, one of the pub file here. Uh, it says exactly what you need to do, right? Hey, here's what you changed. Here's what you need to run to fix it, which is helpful. The other ones can't always do that. This does, and. Um, this purely looks at what file names are going into the commit. It doesn't tell you if it's actually a functional change to your gem file. Maybe you changed some spacing and you don't need to regenerate it. It is not that smart. Uh, validate Puppet files. This is on the Puppet Labs. This is on the Puppet web page of things you should do. Make sure your code like looks same. You know, I put a couple open curly braces in there and run it. It says, hey, that's, that's just not Puppet code. That's never going to run. Pretty straightforward. Um, shell check. I love this thing, and nobody. Have any of you heard of it? <sighs> no one. Awesome. Shell check is written in Haskell, which is the downside. Um, it is a static code analyzer for shell scripts. You run it on a shell script, and it will tell you, "Hey, this thing you're doing here only works on some versions of Bash or on some Unixes," or "Hey, you're calling this as bin sh, but you're relying on Bashism." Uh, it is fantastic. We ran it through. We now run all of our shell scripts through it. We did one pass where we just cleaned them all up, and it found bugs that would have taken forever. And it will say, hey, if this variable is empty, like this whole file is going to do something differently because of how you wrote this test. Or, hey, if there's a space in that, it's going to mess up. It's going to wreck your day. Oh, thank you, Shell. Sorry. Uh, they also have a web page variant where it's just you can paste Shell in there and it does it. This is fantastic. I love this software. Uh, unfortunately, I would love to tell you who wrote it, but uh, it's somebody on GitHub who, whose username is Koala Man. <laughs> They're very smart. They clearly know a lot of Haskell. Oh. So Koala Man, if you're out there, thanks. Uh, and so here's an example. I just I dumped some stuff into a bad into a shell script, and it, this is all things that it has found that are wrong with that, which it actually found more problems than I than I thought I put in there, which is neat. Um, because of how it works, it has, you know, this is, hey, the order of output redirection really matters. This doesn't work in really almost any shell, and even the shells it does, it's flaky. 
You have to fix that. That's the error here. But then warnings of, hey, all of these things can be misinterpreted by the wrong shell. You should all go download this thing and run it. It is fantastic. Uh, I will warn you that if you brew install it on your Mac, how many of you are using Macs and brew? Brew, yay. Yeah. Very good. Um, if you don't have a Haskell compiler, your machine's going to be doing that for about four hours. Totally serious. The, the Haskell compiler takes forever to install. Then it'll be great. Or find a binary. <coughs> Brew will not do that for you. And then you can learn Haskell. That's fun language. Uh, I'm embarrassed by this deeply. So we have SSL keys and certs in Puppet for like internal services and stuff. Um, and so you can all boo me if you need. So that's terrible, right? Like the fact that I have SSL keys just hanging out in GitHub for anybody who can get into that C is super embarrassing. That's what I've got. And it's almost all internal stuff, so I feel a little less bad about that, but I'm still bad. Um, so we check if you have a key and a cert there, and we have a very strict naming scheme for those. It makes sure that they're like the right, they match. We do that by looking at the modulus, which is deep in crypto land, don't worry about that. Uh, and here's why. So if you, let's say you change a key, or you get a new cert. You have a, you generate a new cert, and you forget that you've generated a new key, and so you just copy the cert there, not the key. And you drop it into Apache, and you restart Apache. You get this. Um, and all of you know what that means, right? That's, it's pretty legible as to what's going wrong there. Uh, pro tip, that warning is not about that. That site, totally different. Don't worry about that. What you can't see here is that the next thing Apache does here is stop. You've reloaded Apache, you, you, hey, Apache, would you restart as your config good? Yep, restart, okay. Nope. And you're down. Whole site, whole site's off, and this is off in some weird log net. It's not just in like the error log where you'd expect, it's off in crazy town. <sighs> Number of times we got woken up by this before we wrote this silly shack, huge. Uh, and so here's an example of it. Uh, I generate a new key into a place that already has a cert, and um, it's very loud. Um, I'm extra proud of the yo, 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 being the. You may ask why this is so emphatic when all the other ones are less emphatic. Right, because you can bypass this thing. Uh, here's why. Um, so at, at Backstop, we use Jira, and we have a project called Instance TPS, uh, Trouble and Project System. Uh, we've all seen Office Space. It's an Office Space joke. Well, so the site just kind of stopped serving. We host, we host websites for 100 customers. It's like www.customername.com. Hold on. Why? Well, uh, a guy who I'm not naming, I mean, his name's Chris, but other than that, <laughs> tried to update this SSL cert, and the prehook failed. He was like, well, I know this is the right cert, like, stupid prehook, and did it anyway. And we were down and sad. Uh, and so, that's, that's, I mean, it's his, it, it is literally his fault in that he did it, but clearly he didn't know that that check is actually pretty good. It's never, there's, an, I've never seen a false positive in it. It's possible, but I don't, I, I, I doubt that there are many of them. And so that's why the text is so emphatic about please do not do this. You, it knows better than you think because we had a really bad outage and I had to talk to a ton of our customers who were angry and yelling about why our site went down at a time it shouldn't have. Is that his fault? No, the software should not have allowed that. We should have been, you know, there's a lot of reasons that shouldn't have happened, but that. Uh, you, you can't quite see there, but that ticket that's grayed out is the document SSL purchase renewal is a thing that was caused by this. So it turns out I was the only one who knew that worked well enough to know, for instance, that that pre-check was, that pre oak was okay. That's my fault. That's my answer. Um, YAML files. Should validate them because things will go wrong. We lean really heavily on create resources. We read a YAML file and call create resources, which it turns out is not a thing we have to do anymore. Yay! And so those YAML files being bad means that Puppet, like, the whole parts of the site aren't there. And so the most common, the most common source of these is merge conflicts. You merge two branches, you get the like. Less than, less than, less than, less than, less than, less than. Hey, there's a merge conflict here, and you don't notice it, and so you just check it in anyway. 
and then the file doesn't parse, doesn't load. So, uh, and this is another where the error message is not super helpful, right? Hey, in this deep Ruby library that you've never heard of, uh, unless you've done this before, uh, I couldn't find a colon when, I don't know, things went wrong. It doesn't even print out the file name. That error doesn't even tell you what file went wrong, it just went wrong. And so uh, you see that little is in vagrant.yaml is something we added to say, like, that's the file of church. Um, this requires a little explanation. We, so we used to be just have just this big ball of modules in our Puppet manifest, uh, repository. So if your own module was in there, Puppet library didn't do anything. It just was there, you got loaded on all the servers. As we were, as we were trying to use librarian more and change our workflow for all of this, we had to put them in another directory and then have it copy them in. So we wrote a little custom uh, librarian, <coughs> librarian provider is the term to go grab this from this directory. But now you can write a new module and cite modules and not put it in the puppet file, and it's just not there when you try to use it. You bring up a new node and you use your module you just wrote, and nope, never heard of it. That's really weird, right? Or uh, you add something to the Puppet, you delete a module and you don't delete it from the Puppet file and then it just keeps you from deploying. And so, I, this is hard to show in a way that's not logical, just for, trust me, that's what it, it um, this thing reads through Puppet file, all of the entries that are a local module, it makes sure there's a directory there, then it looks through all the local directories and makes sure they're in Puppet file. I can show that off afterward, or if I have time, but it's it's kind of long. Okay, so that's all happening on your local machine. You type, get commit, put in a message, and all of that happens. This is pretty fast, actually. On a, on a we buy people nice machines, and it you don't feel all of this happening. It just happens. Uh, you're not. I've written hooks that took like five minutes to run, and that's frustrating. So you want to get with it. So then testing, so what do you do? So we, you, you've made this change, you've committed it, you push it up to GitHub. Jenkins then allows you to deploy your branch out to the Puppet Masters to run on machines. And what does that deploy look like? Uh, it runs Rake to delete the modules directory and then run librarian Puppet install and build that Vagrant YAML that I made a mess of in a few slides previous. And then it runs Capistrano to get a list of all the Puppet Masters because we stand Puppet Masters up and down, not super frequently, but enough that this was annoying to have a manual list. So it asks some mCollected, what are all the machines as, that are running Puppet Masters? And then uses Capstrata to dump uh, the, the thing it just built with Rake onto all those machines and move some symlinks around. Uh, we had to make this change because of Puppet 4 compatibility. We're not doing Puppet 4 yet, but you had to move to Etsy Puppet environments basically. You can put it in another place, but that layout had to change, so this should all change. And we have a script, uh, puppet build, that tells our Jenkins server to do your deploy. Um, and so it, uh, GitHub user and stuff are just in your, in your environment, and it runs it and says, all right, this is your environment to test against. Bill Weiss 2015 Puppet Camp. Uh, that is now available on every machine in the company if you want to test against that. And that takes, I don't know, it takes a minute and a half, maybe five minutes when it's really busy, when a lot of people are working. Uh, I'd love to say that then the CI system goes and like runs those on all kinds of machines and tells you if your change is good or not. Nope. Uh, someday, I went back through my slides from last year and been saying someday for more than a year now, so that's on me. So, it's up to you. Your own code, you make sure it's not bad. We have Vagrant, we have Cloudstack. That Cloudstack logo looks terrible. The software is better than their logo. Anyway, uh, uh, Vagrant is, we, we didn't have this, and we had a hack day, and somebody came to me and said, hey, would you, would you look at this change I made? I think it allows us to run all of our puppet modules in Vagrant. What? <laughs> Not even somebody on the like systems team or the developers said, you know, I'm sick of having to provision machines in CloudStack. Their logo's, logo's terrible and it's slow, and so I'm just doing this myself. Yeah. 
And so you can now use Vagrant and say, hey, I've got, here's a, here's a type of machine uh, or a, a class of servers, maybe that's a few. Bring them all up and run my code and see what happens. Yeah. This is, it needs about a day of hack time to get everybody using it, but at that point, anybody writing Puppet can use it. Uh, right now, there's a little manual tweaking for different types of machines and what they all look like. Podstack is great, despite me ripping on it. It has worked super well for us. Uh, we installed it one day just to see what it was like. We took a couple old machines, we installed Podstack, and now we have a full rack of machines running in. And we have capacity for, please tell me about the slide in. Yeah. So here's the, the system that our devs can play with. One and a half terabytes of memory, um, 30 terabytes of disk, uh, 3.6 terahertz of CPU. Um, and this thing is like, always in use. This is fantastic. We built this, and the developers use it all the time. And so that available memory that's currently, you've got about a third of it free, we are buying new nodes right now, because sometimes it's like getting full. Awesome. Anyway, so CloudStack, in case you don't know, is kind of like AWS or one of those things. You build, you bring up machines, there's an API or a nice clicky interface. And in our case, you can just say, build me a couple machines that I'm going to run the backstop application on. It brings them up, it puppets them. Uh, it knows that you requested that machine, so it then makes sure that you have root on it and can do whatever you want with it. They're not customer facing, it's away from the customer facing data center, so you can do whatever you want there. And so people have this, these two things have allowed us to now, uh, teams have come to the systems team and said, hey, we're ready for this thing to be in production. You've never heard of this project other than you knew we were working on it, here it is. It already runs in CloudStack, we know it runs in a single puppet run, it comes up by itself, it deploys, go. And that's awesome. Because then they're not waiting on the systems team to do all that stuff. Uh, and then this puppet test thing is, the workhorse of all of this, which is anybody in the company who has access to a machine, so if you can log into a backstop server, you have the ability to do this as root. Uh, no off with this environment and see what's gonna change. Works way better than you would give it credit for. Uh, you have root on your cloud stack machines or on Vagrant, of course, and you can run your chain. So there you can actually bring a machine up and say, don't know of it, really run this this puppet code, thank you. And everywhere else you can run that puppet test and see what NoOps says. Normally someone's like, well, but, but NoOp can sometimes write to the, the system. It can, uh, but we can talk about that afterward. But it's, it's close enough. We haven't had any failures where that was really the reason it went wrong. Um, I Googled for an image of can't fail and um, Turns out this place in Oakland called a Can't Fail <coughs> Cafe that I've been to. It's the first Google image for, for Can't Fail, I don't know. Uh, it, this has, like, what could be better than all of that, right? Like manual testing and a bunch of just run this thing a bunch of places, like, what could be better? Well, <laughs> once you're done there, then you pull request it into Office, uh, into the backstop Puppet Repo Office. And some of you don't, in fact, know what this looks like, so you have used GitHub. I've got a, got a screenshot later, but a pull request is basically saying, hey, this branch I have here, please merge it into your branch there. I'm ready for it to run in test. We don't squash commits. Some people believe in that. That's kind of a, that's a near religious belief. I don't know. Uh, people have to write messages about what their poll's gonna do. And then we have labels that say, yellow there needs a friend, means I think this works, but I'm not sure and I would like somebody who knows Puppet better or is in a different team to look. Uh, pending something means this isn't done, but I want it here so people can know what I'm working on. Super helpful if you're making a big change. And then green is go. And if you have commit access and you're writing Puppet code, let's say I wrote a module and I, I wrote my employee request, it, you're totally not supposed to just merge it in without any help. But sometimes <laughs> you do. Um, so shame on me. Um, so that is what that looks like. You know, in, in the perfect world, it'd be somebody else who did that merge there. That was my fault. Uh, when I'm talking about Office, you'll see this is going uh, from a repository that doesn't know about, or in a backstop office. Uh, office is, like, literally, like, the place I work. 
which has all of our test machines and machines that aren't super important. So the machines that all of our devs test the software on, the machines that are support people use to log in and test something, those are all there. And then so you, you, you get into there and it runs. And if we have a rash of broken machines, then we know it's probably not ready to go to production. And then you pull it up to master. All the production runs master. And so then you do that pull request. Again, you shouldn't, you shouldn't merge your own pull request. Uh, I didn't in this case, yay. Uh, so this is an example, right? I say, hey, I want to go from office to master. I'm picking up uh, zone generation problems on this front end. And then Paul, who is not here to defend himself on this, has made a Splunk change that I'm pretty sure is OK. Pretty sure. And that's, that's sarcastic. Uh, Paul knows what he's doing. We've all seen that change. It was fine. It had been well tested. But sarcasm is totally okay in this. And then somebody else merged it. So I didn't just say, yep, this is good. Go. Bro. We've done it. Yay. Uh, so now that it's all in production. It's all like in front of customers. And we don't run it daily, as I said earlier, because things could go wrong. We've actually never had Puppet just trash a machine. Despite all those people and my kind of hand wavy testing and everything, we've never had it go super wrong. A little wrong, but not bad enough that we would do this. Uh, but we're always afraid of this. Right? We made this change, and then there goes production. All the customer data is gone. Uh, and that's a testing problem. And it doesn't have, we've, we've never had even a machine or two go just horrifically wrong and like time to go to backup. Or whatever. It has happened. Uh, that's probably because we're awesome. No, but uh, it's probably because people try, right? People do this testing, and they know that there are no, there should be automated safeties there, but there aren't really, and so they're careful. Uh, and so run times are staggered by the environment. And so you just kind of cowboy in production. You go, yeah, this change is safe. Go, yeah. Uh, if if the uh, let me see if I can find this. One. Our our group agreement is that uh, yeehaw means I, I'm just doing it in production. Like, no, no second set of eyes, sorry. It turns out by spelling and punctuation, you can tell who's doing this without seeing usernames. If there's a dash there or not, there's an exclamation or not. You can fingerprint everybody in the company does this, which admittedly is four people. Um, so why office and master? Uh, testing machines are in the office. That's a little crazy because there are machines in the office that actually matter, right? The Jira instance that I was showing is a test machine. Where's the production? It's, it's that too. Uh, it's gone pretty well for us. Uh, many of these things, as I said, those pre-commit hooks are all things that went wrong and made, our, made us sad. And so this just hasn't happened yet, which is awesome. Uh, and so nothing customer facing, mostly, is in the office. Uh, Windows servers, there's, we have an exchange and stuff. Those are in the office. They don't run Puppet yet. I've been eyeing Puppet on Windows, but they, that team keeps fighting me away from them. I lost my admin account a couple weeks ago for that. Um, and so then the, the weird office to master thing, always merging into office but basing off of master, means you can cherry pick changes. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Git, you can, so you have a list of commits, you can say, well, I want to grab these two but not the ones around them and put them into master. We do not do that. We probably don't do that monthly. It happens every once in a while where we have a change that has to go right now and a change that really needs to bake a little longer. And so you can do that with some hand-holding and some terrifying Git tools that shouldn't be used on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can do it. And so if people base their stuff from Office, they're then stuck with all the commits before them and we can't as easily move them to master. We can. So, that was a lot. Questions about that before I talk about things that could get better in that. Lots could get better, but near term get better. The grammar there was terrible. Things that will in near term get better. There we go. Oh, all right. So easy, but not easy, but good changes here would be to have the CI system run that same pre-commit script against all of those pull requests. Right now, if somebody disables that pull that that pre-commit. So they shouldn't do, but it happens, or they never install it, then we just don't know that they didn't run them. And so then in production, Puppet's not working. That makes us sad. 
Uh, and so GitHub has a really nice system, show right here. Uh, your CI system can give you a green check or red X to say this has passed tests. Uh, that, I'm, I'm gonna go wire that up. So now I've admitted to everybody that we don't do it. Uh, <laughs> RSpec, uh, do any of you care deeply about RSpec Puppet in here? Before I say like mean things about it. Okay, so <laughs> RSpec Puppet, um, we have never had a failure that RSpec would have caught in our case. We never have a problem of, oh, this no longer installs Apache, whoops. And maybe my RSpec understanding is not deep enough, but it's all that the code did what you told it to, but maybe that wasn't what you or the company wanted. And so we, every once in a while we go, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna write specs for all of this, and it peters out because you're just copying these existing code into specs, and it's boring, and what does it get you? And because of that, that all the manifests are, in, all the modules are in that one big repo, or most of them, running specs in there takes forever. Uh, a spec run of just a couple of specs per module is like a 20 minute task on my laptop. And uh, well, nobody's gonna do that, people are bypassing. Uh, and then server spec or beaver or whatever the new cool thing is, would be really nice. Those would allow you to write tests of actually run this code and then test it externally. Is it still running a web server? Is the application up? Is there a database there? Those would all be great. But that's harder to get running. Though with CloudStack, we can now do it. The CI system could, once we had faith in that testing, uh, could auto-merge those pull requests and could do that office to master promotion daily if we wanted. That would be, that'd be great. Machinery around it, once we do that. So I said that right now you, you, you run that uh, that Jenkins job that deploys your stuff, and you go to machines and run Puppet. It could do that for you, right? You could say, pick a couple random machines that look like this, and go run it in op and tell me what that looks like. That would be great, because it would keep people from having to do that manually. And then Jenkins could have authorization to do that on machines that maybe a given user doesn't. And that would be, that would be good. We haven't quite figured out how to do that without a bunch of hand-holding of it, but it, this can and should happen, and will soon. That's it. Uh, so do you have questions? Do you, you want to make fun of everything I'm doing there? That's easy. Do that in private, at least, if you have a lot of mocking to do. Yes? question was how long did it take us to go from our old terrible subversion setup to this less terrible git based setup, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, on one hand, I can say about two years, because that's how long we've been doing it, year and a half. But you know, each, each part of this came slowly, right? We, we cut over to git, we came up with a workflow, and we had everything manual. Then we added tests, or we added that pre-commit. It was all kind of a gradual rollout. And there are parts of this that changed in the time between when I first wrote these slides and today. Right? I fixed these slides yesterday because some of those pre-commits changed. And so you don't have, it's not an all or nothing thing. You don't have to just do it and you know, show up to work one day and all right, here everybody, here's how we do it now. You can do it gradually. And each part of this is better than not doing it, even if they're not interlocking. Another question over here somewhere? Okay. So you mean uh, you kind of you know the, the R spec kind of kind of issue? How consistent is the operating system environment in an organization? Do you all use the same kind of versions of Red Hat? How how do you kind of manage that? The question was how do we how uh, how homogenous is our our environment here? And the answer is most of the servers run two versions of CentOS or a handful of versions of Ubuntu. The Ubuntu machines are all special snowflakes. Um, Almost all, yeah. Uh, and then in the office, it's all, so the test machines are all built off of those same systems. They're kickstarted the same, they're built the same. So those are very, there's basically one version of CentOS 5, one of 6, one of 7 that we target. It's 5 are going away, but they're still there. And Ubuntu LTS, you know, 12.4 and 14.4 LTS. And so we've abstracted some of that stuff out, but it's not terrible. It's not, we're not supporting AIX and Solaris and Windows and Macs and everything. These are all, they're all Linux. 
Other questions? All right. Go. Oh, yes. I might have missed it. So what's holding you up from doing those three commit tests in Jenkins? The question is, what's holding us up from doing the pre-commit tests in Jenkins? Nothing. Yeah. Uh, the answer is, doing them on the local boxes was much easier, because that you know everybody can run it right there, and then uh, moving it into Jenkins is a thing that needs to happen, and it just needs somebody to do it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of this that the blocker is somebody caring enough to do it, and I'm not going to say I like this this uh, as a rule, but sometimes the answer is someday you'll get angry about it and fix it. That's where that pre-commit came from. One day I was like, okay, it is embarrassing that this happens. Here, everybody install this thing, go. Do I like getting work done like that? I mean, it's fun, but I don't like that being the way it gets done. It works. Uh, all right, quick things before I get down. Uh, Day Day Chicago, I'm wearing my organizer shirt, is coming right up, August 25th to 26th. Uh, in Chicago, two days of talks about all kinds of DevOpsy things. Very few that are like specific tool talks like this. But it, we had a great turnout last year. It worked really well. Please come. Uh, we have CFP is open. We'd love to hear talks from pretty much anybody about things that you're doing, uh, things that you're not doing, we wish you are, whatever. Uh, or if you, and I'm happy, I will personally help you figure out a, a talk. If you have an idea and you want to make it better, I will help you with that. We have other people who can. Uh, and if you don't speak, either because we get too many awesome talks and you get selected or you, you don't want to, uh, registration's open, it's fairly inexpensive, please come join us. And again, come to the users group. That's it, thank you.